Alright, so I'm going to talk about bog work, uh, how I learned to stop worrying and all the So, first off, I am Wesley Berry. I go by Genius Online, so that is probably more useful for GitHub and Twitter and whatnot. Um, I work for Engineer. They're kind enough to employ me to work on fog full time. Uh, I've been doing that now since the uh, beginning of September, I believe. Um, so, the amount of progress that I've been able to make in that full time. Time has been amazing compared to the bits and pieces of time I could scrape together when I was doing it as a pet project. Um, as has been mentioned a couple times, we're doing a hack fest tonight. Um, I'll definitely be there probably for the whole time if I can manage to uh, stay awake that long. Um, should be a lot of fun. If you have any questions about this stuff, uh, we'd be very nice to ask it. Um, so, first off, just to be clear, um, cloud is a word that gets thrown around a lot these days. Um, so just to be clear what I'm talking about when I talk about cloud, since it's something that I work with a lot, um, is that it's something that's API-driven and it's on-demand. I think those are both the key, at least to cloud as I understand it, or cloud as I care about it, perhaps. Um, so some of the core things from that are doing compute or DNS or storage. Um, but there's also some things that are kind of on the fringe that are starting to move into this territory. Things like uh, key value storage or load balancers where there's a few places where you can get them in this kind of way, but in a lot of cases, um, you're kind of on your own still in those areas. Um, so, to, to dig in a little bit more, it's on demand, so you only pay for what you use. It's different from traditional hosting, for instance, where you pay for server months, kind of, instead of server hours or server minutes. Um, so, this is, this is really nice, especially if you're working on a pet project over the weekend. You can maybe only run your servers during the weekend when you're working on it, and not pay for during the week when you didn't get a touch because you're doing your day job. Um, and it's flexible. You can add and remove resources in minutes, not not days or weeks or months, as it would have been if you had to go and fill out a form somewhere and get somebody to go and pay for these things. Um, and it's repeatable. You can set up um, so that a server spins up and some configuration happens, and make sure they did the right thing, and know with some confidence that you can do that. Again, tomorrow if you need one more server, or the next day if you needed three servers, so on and so forth. And from that you can build more resilient systems, because if you don't think about the server necessarily always being there, you can account for that and build systems where you can more easily add and remove resources as you need to. Um, so that's great, but why, why am I worried then, right? Like this all sounds very promising. And the problem is that you quickly run into option overload. There's a lot of different providers, there's a lot of different services, it can be very hard when you're first entering the space to figure out, okay, do I want AWS? Do I want Rackspace? What, what are, why would I choose one or the other? Uh, what, you know, what do they give me and not? What do they cost? Um, and, and along with that is, is this expertise. Like, uh, feature set aside, you have to learn a whole different set of knowledge to work with each of these individual providers, which can be very difficult and a lot of upfront effort. Um, and it also gets you locked in. It's very hard to switch once you've made the effort of spending five weeks deciding that you understand AWS and how to actually use it. Um, so there are tools, um, but when I was first coming into this, I found that the tools were vastly different from one another, frequently vastly different from the APIs that they were actually serving. Um, and the quality and maintenance of those was very, from project to project, was very difficult to tell if they were still maintained. Um, so I decided to start working on my own. Uh, the other thing, too, that a lot of people ask me about is standards. Standards is another way that we can possibly approach this. I think the standards process is good, but it's been slow, and in many cases the standards end up getting interpreted in such vastly different ways that it's kind of a joke to say that they have a standard in the first place. Um, so, my approach to dealing with this ended up being this thing called Paul. And initially it started out pretty humbly, I just started working on a couple little services because I wanted to learn them better. Um, did a lot of like really low level stuff, it wasn't that fun to use, you still needed to have a lot of expert knowledge. Um, and eventually, built on top of that, built abstractions, and it got better and better. And eventually it got to the point where I was like, wow, I'm really onto something. And so, why I think maybe I'm onto something is, first off, it's portable. Um, if you use the higher level abstractions, you can actually move back and forth between providers. Um, pretty straightforward. I mean, you get away from what the actual provider's APIs look like because it's difficult to have one API that is exactly the same matching. But if you use these higher level abstractions, you can move back and forth, which I think is pretty powerful. Um, and there's a lot of different abstractions then that actually provide for this flexibility and power. 
Um, it's pretty established now. I, I recently got over a thousand followers on GitHub, have 85,000 downloads, a bunch of contributors to Forbes, and I'm working full time on it. So, um, certainly hope that that uh, indicates that it's here to stay. Um, and there's also some locking built in. So, there's a lot of cases where you can actually try out what would happen and work on building out exactly what your provisioning workflow is without necessarily having to worry about explicitly spending up real resources that you have to pay money for or that you have to wait for. Like, at some point, you obviously have to do that, but this can get you a long way towards that when you're just doing testing and trying to bootstrap and figure out what you're doing. Um, and so also, I just wanted to mention, we already have uh, a decent number of people, more all the time, that are using it, both products and libraries, um, which is very exciting. And so, first off, just a little interactive bit, make sure everybody's still awake after the boring definitions part, make sure we're on the same page thing. Um, just a quick show of hands for people that are using the cloud. At, as I defined it anyway. So it's, it's a pretty good number. And then if you can keep your hands up if you're doing it with Fog already. So it's, it's a much smaller number, but there's at least a few. It's not completely crushing to my ego, but you know, just a little bit. So we'll work on that. All right, so for the rest of you, because most of you didn't actually raise your hand for either, um, frequently what I get is, this, this stuff sounds great, but I don't actually have a use case for that, right? Like, I don't need cloud on a day-to-day -day basis. So, for uh, the purpose of this presentation, I'm actually going to give you a make-believe purpose, and we'll walk through how you might actually go about using this stuff given that purpose. So the purpose is we're going to build an uptime site. Um, and we even have a tagline, because who wants a busted site, right? This is going to be our next big thing. We're going to work on it on the weekends. We're going to kick it out there. We're going to charge. Five bucks a month to each person that gets it. Hope we get enough people. You know, we get twenty thousand people, and pretty soon that's our salary, right? It's it's going to be great. So, first off, simply uh, we just need to do setup. So you can then install Bob or sudo if you're not using RBM, don't have stuff set up such that it works right, obviously. Um, so the first thing you do is just create a connection. So compute is one of the abstractions that I mentioned. This is a represents all the different compute providers basically in an abstract way. So you pass some credentials in. Um, this is what a credential set might look like. This is for Rackspace in particular. So we're saying, the provider I actually want to use is Rackspace. And here are my Rackspace credentials. And we want to boot a server. So first off, we say, OK, I'm going to call create server. And I'm going to pass these two params. I'll explain more about that later. And get back the body of this thing and look at the server, right? Of course. We, uh, going to sit around and wait a little bit until the server becomes active, because we can't really do much with it until then. Anyway. Uh, and then we're going to run some SSH commands. We're going to place our uh, our key so that we can SSH in. We're going to turn off root password, because Rackspace hands you a root password back, which is kind of bogus. And then we're going to start it up. So that's like super easy, right? I mean, no problem. I mean, it only took me an hour, and I did this stuff all the time. Uh, I mean, it's not easy, right? This, this, is, this is exactly why I work, right? That, that was kind of a pain in the butt, right? I had to know a lot of very specific things to get that to work. I don't expect that many of you are going to be able to pick up that much specific stuff in a short period of time at all. And this is your weekend project. You don't want to spend the first 10 weekends figuring out how to use clouds enough to build this, this site. You want to get off the ground, right? So, you know, th th there are these arguments. I don't know what they are, but one in 49, you know, who knows, right? And it's only going to work on Rackspace in this configuration because it's very specific to Rackspace. I did it. So I mean, this was how I started out, but I quickly realized that this was a, a disservice, really, right? I had tooling, but the tooling wasn't really gaining me very much, right? If I'm so back to square one of making these API calls more or less from scratch, like I could use NetHttp and not really, you know, be in a better place. So. Um, from there, I've made a lot of improvements, so I'm going to give you a better idea of how that might work. So instead, we can get this compute thing that we had before and call servers on it, which is a collection of servers that kind of represents all of your servers on that service. And you can call bootstrap with a set of server attributes. Um, and so the server attributes then, uh, we can see now 49 is actually the image ID. That's, that's how cool we now know what 49 is. Well, sort of. It's Ubuntu, if that helps. But you, you at least know where that fits into the slots, right? And we're going to say what the private and public key are so that it'll be able to place it for us. Um, and then, effectively, this will do everything that that 40 or so lines that I showed you before did. But you did it in, I mean, if you wanted to put the hash in lines, one line could. Um, so, what is the service then, right? So, 
It's a collection. It's kind of like an ORM sort of thing. So you can just call servers. It's a lazy loaded thing. So if you call servers or servers at all, you get back a list of what you have. Um, you can call servers.get with a particular ID and just get that particular one back. Um, you can use reload to say, I know that you have a copy of what the data was like when I called this in the first place, but I have reason to suspect that it's changed over time, so please make sure you have the most recent. Um, you can use new. This uh, creates a local version of the thing, so it doesn't actually say spin up a server, but it just creates a local representation if you need to manipulate that and get things in order before you kick it off. And then there's create, which does the new, but actually will kick the server off into the cloud as well. Um, so now what we need to do is actually get into our, uh, our actual recording of uptime data, right? So we're going to use ping to do this. So we're going to use the SSH command on the server that we created a little bit ago and call ping c10 and target. So target is going to be specified presumably by our customer, right? Maybe they want to they want to you know check is my site up at home, right? So that's what the target is going to be. Ping c10 will run ping 10 times and then it gives you a kind of aggregate result down at the bottom. Um, so we're just going to pull the standard out off of the first command that the SSH thing ran, and then. This is a comment to explain what I do next, which is kind of ugly. So I could have used a regex or a, a parsing expression grammar or something, but instead I just did some splits and stuff just because I wanted a quick, easy example, right? So uh, the line six basically is what that result line looks like. So I'm splitting the whole result set by new lines and just getting the last line, splitting it by the white spaces and getting minus two. So the a slash b slash c slash d, which is the min max out of standard deviation. Split them by another slash, and you have all the data. I know that was very complicated. I apologize. But the important thing, I think, to note is that so far, the most complex code of booting up the server somewhere out in the world and pinging something and getting back aggregated stat results, the most complex thing was actually parsing that string. Right? Everything else is pretty easy. You set some params, you just go. So the next thing is we're just going to clean up. So we call server up, destroy it, it'll shut it down. So we don't have to worry about getting charged um, over and over again. And we can just throw the results that we just pulled into a hash that we can then store somewhere or throw into a database or what have you. Um, and then from there, we can move on uh, to trying this on a new provider. Because since we're doing uptime, we might want to say, put something in US East of Amazon but also say put something in Rackspace Dallas because we want to go ping from multiple locations in case one particular backbone was down or something like that. Um, so going back to my previous example, this is a diff of me taking that and changing it so that it ran on Amazon instead. And you can see just how much similarity there is here between the two. I mean, the, the simple, like naive, low-level script, there's almost nothing that's the same. It's, I mean, it's funny. It's comical because the things that are the same are like largely coincidental, like the one. It happens to have a one in more or less the same place in both scripts, but I think it means something completely different. Um, so anyway, we can go from that to, to this, right? We use the same code we used before, but we just set a different set of credentials and we set a different set of attributes for the server because there are some discrepancies between the providers. Um, they look pretty similar though, and we end up with a server again. We can run the same SSH stuff. Everything else will just work. Um, and from there, also, you can do simple stuff like taking that existing thing that we just used and merging in a different region, say, for Amazon, so that we can ping to from even more locations and have better coverage for our customers. Um, so from there, you know, the, the subsequent versions of this geopinging idea are pretty much just moving down the list of other supported providers, and this is just a subset of them. Um, and you can just add them as you're needed um, and lather, rinse, and repeat. So, I mean, that's great, but how did I how did I even know what half this stuff was? How did I know that that ID was a bunch of so on? So, fault comes with binary. Uh, when you install it, if you run it immediately, you'll get back something that looks kind of like this, which says, please create this file that has your credentials in it so that subsequent times when I boot, I'll actually know what you're dealing with so I can just load that up and you can go and do that. Um, so, assuming we've done that, you can get in and there are these kind of signposts. So, the first thing that's going to happen is we'll say, Welcome to Blog Interactive, and it'll let you know I'm using the default credential set because you can specify a different credential set if you want, and that you now have access to AWS and Rackspace because those credentials are available. 
Um, so you can call providers, this will give you back the same thing <laughs> if you needed to do that. Um, and then on Rackspace itself, you can call collections. This will tell you about things like servers, but this will give you the whole list that's available on Rackspace. So this is a somewhat longer list. Um, you're going to see also that it has directories and files which maps to Rackspace storage instead of Rackspace compute. So these top level things share the abstractions for everything basically that that space provides. If you need a specific one, you can say, I just want the compute provider, and, and that looks like that. You can just get back the compute provider. And you can also ask the compute provider what request it supports. And this gets down into the low level nasty stuff that I showed you at the beginning. It is low level and nasty, but occasionally you want to do something on a provider that's very specialized to that provider that the abstraction probably doesn't provide, but you really need it. So all that stuff's available. Um, and this can give you back a list of all of those um, things that have been implemented in case you need it. So just to, to kind of go top down, then what are all these you know, nouns that I keep using? Um, so providers are like Amazon or Rackspace or um, Zerigo, for instance. They're, they're kind of top level. It's a company that provides services, but it's not the services themselves. The services themselves are, say, EC2, which is Amazon's compute, or uh, Rackspace servers, which is Rackspace's compute, or S3, which is uh, Amazon's storage. Um, and so right now, the main top-level ones are compute, DNS, and storage, and there may be additional ones as uh, kind of demand comes up. Um, so then there are collections. This is like flavors and using servers, and then those contain models, so that, that's the individual ones of those. And then there are requests, and so the collections and models are built, all built on top of requests, the same as if you were going to do that low-level stuff, um, just kind of cuts out the middleman. Um, <clears throat> so just briefly, the requests themselves, since I kind of blaze over that before, you can call, say, list servers, you get back an XCOM response, um, which basically has a body, headers, and a status. Um, so if you know HTTP stuff, pretty simple, you can get from that what you need. Um, and so the next thing is just to do a quick sanity check. We'll go back through and basically say, give me all the servers that are currently ready, which is equivalent to either checking if it's running or checking if it's active or whatever. It differs from service to service, but it means the machine is up, right? So <clears throat> we'll just check for all of our running servers on both of these services to make sure we didn't forget any so that we don't have to have a huge bill because I have literally left 20 Amazon servers running like overnight before without realizing it and then woke up the next day and I was like, I'm almost as sad as my credit card is sad. <laughs> but thankfully they were small, so that helps. It was still like 70 bucks for like 12 hours, so annoying. All right, so the next thing was also finding those images. How did I know that 49 was Ubuntu? So there's a, a helpful thing inside of here on the collections called the table. If you call table without any arguments, it will just give you a nice kind of like table in the format you'd expect from MySQL stuff in the console kind of. Um, but you can also specify, in this case I'm saying, I only want the ID and name columns. You can leave all the other ones off because it'll wrap and look ugly and I won't be able to read it anyway. We get something like this. This omits all the other images just to show you the example. And then for AWS images, I actually just cheated. There's uh, elastic.com has a listing of sort of the official Ubuntu um, images, and I usually use that because the actual listing from Amazon is so enormous that it's very difficult to find anything in the first place. Um, so the thing about exploring this way, though, is that it's kind of slow, it can be kind of expensive, um, and so this kind of segues into the, the mocking stuff that I was talking about. Um, so it's pretty simple to use. You can either call the binary with the environment variable fog mock equals true, which will boot that into the mock mode, or you can require fog and then call fog.mock before you start making calls. Um, it's meant to be a simulation. So in most cases, things will just work. Um, there may be some edge cases, uh, but for the most part, um, it seems to work really well for most people. Um, and if a mock isn't implemented, rather than kind of working or something, um, it's set up such that they'll actually raise explicit errors so you know immediately, oh, that thing's not mocked, maybe I either should add a mock for it or file a bug that I need a mock for it, so on and so forth. Um, so you don't get, hopefully you run off track where the mock just has some weird behavior that doesn't match with the service at all. And I actually run the tests against both real and mock modes. Um, there are some exceptions where I have pending tests and stuff where mocks aren't implemented, but for the most part, the, the spec suite works on both. So if you find an error, we need to add a new test to make sure that that edge case doesn't appear or recur or whatever, and it will be uh, good. 
good to go. So this aside, we're back to business, right? You have all this data from your painting, and now you want to do something with it because you don't want to just have this data on your development machine. If it crashes, your customers are going to be pretty ticked off. So we're going to talk about aggregating these data using cloud storage. Um, so this is probably somewhat familiar where you connect to a storage provider. Um, here is a credential set for connecting to S3. Um, and then within the storage providers, the top level thing is directories. This would map an Amazon to buckets, but it maps to containers on Rackspace files and some other things. Basically, it's meant to be kind of a generalized thing that is hopefully immediately meaningful to you as to what it means and how it works, but without necessarily using the terminology of any one provider. So we're going to create this directory, and we're going to give it a name, and we're going to say that it's going to be public. And then we're going to store a file into it. So we just take that directory and say that we want to create a file, give it a body. If we use file.open like this, it will actually stream the content, um, as opposed to file.read, which would pull all of it into memory before doing it, which would be bad. And then we set the key, set that this is public as well. Unfortunately, you have to do it at both levels, just because some providers have discrepancies there. Sometimes you can set it at the bucket level. Sometimes you can only set it at the object level. Sometimes you need to set it above. Um, in any case, since we are using public, we can actually call public URL on it. And for the services that support it, we'll get back a URL that we could give directly to our customer that would go directly to their data without ever getting our servers, um, which can be really neat. Um, so from there, we'll talk about geostorage, similar to our geopinion. So we can also just use this credential set instead and have the same code work for Rackspace storage. Um, and finally, we'll do our cleanup. So we're just going to grab those directories, destroy the files that are inside of them, and destroy the directories themselves. And again, there's more providers. It's a shorter list for storage. Not as many people are doing it, and I haven't implemented as many that hasn't been demanded. Um, but it's pretty much lather on some feet. So our final phase then is profit, right? So we have our thing, it works. Um, but we want to provide a freemium model, right? So if you have an open source site or something, you can just use your uptime thing for free maybe, but we want to be able to charge people for something. So what we're going to charge people for, we're going to use DNS to provide a special subdomain to each of our customers where they can go and see the data, where they can point their customers to see what the uptime looks like. <clears throat> so we'll connect. Again, this looks pretty similar. This is a connection thingy. Um, pass on a credential set. Using it as a repo this time. And you'll create a zone um, with the domain name and an email address for the administrator. And then inside of that, we'll create a record that has the IP, uh, what our subdomain is going to be, some A type record. And then our customer could be wired up with this DNS to their subdomain. You know, you have to disentangle that sort of on the other end, but it should work for you. And then we'll clean up. Similar to the other ones, you get the zone, you get the records, you destroy stuff. Etc. Et um, in a lot of cases, these things will require you to destroy what's inside of something before you can destroy the parent. That's why I destroyed all the files and why I destroyed all the records. Um, so then, GeoFreemium, uh, this should work on all the different DNS providers. I mean, that's just a subset of them. There's a few more that have been added since then. Um, and it just lather, rinse, and repeat. I think that one of the key things I wanted to focus on in this is that all of these services, once you learn one of them, it's pretty simple to move to another one and see kind of how those pieces fit together. It's a lot of shared stuff. So congratulations. All right. So now you just need to copy and paste and push and deploy out gists of all this stuff so you can all start your uptime businesses and maybe like kind of cutthroat if we have that many of them. But you know, we can also take a few customers and as long as we have enough to do it. So now you just need to budget, right? Find ways to spend this pile of money that I've just given to you effectively. Um, I like coffee and bourbon and games, for instance. Just throwing that out right now. Um, and then retire at your earliest convenience. So, you know, I, I hope that this works for someone. It doesn't seem to be working for me. But, um, so this gets to the love part, right? I talked about why I was worried, why it was difficult for me coming into this, why it's probably difficult for many of you to come into this. Um, I mean, I was, you know, just suffering through trying to figure this out. So I ended up with this thing. I've distributed it. I hope that many of you will use it. It's suffering encoded in Ruby. Actually, I kid. It's, it's expertise encoded in Ruby. It felt a lot like suffering along the way sometimes. But, um, it's really empowering. Uh, I get this comment a lot from people that, 
you know, this makes my job way easier, or, you know, like, I didn't know how to do this stuff before, and now I can just spin up a server when I have some little hobby thing, and it will just work, like, it's great. Um, and that's really exciting to be empowering other people, but also to feel empowered myself. Like, I'm not that much of a sysadmin, like, I managed some stuff on slice hosts through the web UI, basically, was the extent of my knowledge. And so, to be able to say, I want to do some computation on a server, I don't want it to be my server, bam, I have one, I can run some SSH commands on it, whatever else, it's just, like, awesome. It's really exciting. I mean, this is cutting edge stuff. Cloud is, I think, the future in a lot of ways. It's taking some people some time to catch up, but I'm hoping that this lowers the barrier to entry enough that the people in this room, at least, can kind of jump on board and get, uh, you know, a leg up, kind of, on the competition and, and get out there and do the next set of really exciting things. Um, so now, your homework. Alright, so first off, if you follow Fog, I announce releases there, so you can see when new stuff comes out, or uh, if things might get deprecated, or other things, you can kind of just keep a general eye on it. It's pretty quiet, so it doesn't hurt too much to follow. Um, you can also follow the GitHub repo if you want to get a little bit more granular in the detail you're getting about. Um, you can proudly display stickers. Uh, they look like this. There's one on my laptop here. I've compiled them in my bag over there, so feel free to grab me. Um, or find me at the Hackfest or later, and I'm happy to give you some. Um, and you can ask me any remaining questions you have. Hackfest would be a good time for it. There's probably not going to be a lot of time at the end of the talk. And I have a few card games and stuff with me if anybody wants to just hang out and play instead of talking tech, like, I'd love to. Um, so moving up a notch, normal homework, right? So you can report issues on the repo. Um, the issues I'd also add are actually graded. So if it doesn't have a grade next to it, uh, if it doesn't have a grade next to it, you should probably skip it. If it has a grade, I've reviewed it and added commentary on how you can do it to make it easier. Um, there's an IRC channel, there's a Google group. Uh, you can write blog posts or give lightning talks. I record those with blue t-shirts. Um, the hard homework is help working on fog.io for giving information, send pull requests, you get a gray t-shirt if you become a contributor. And the expert homework is to help maintain the cloud ser services you depend on and to become a collaborator and actually get a commit fit when you get a black shirt. And I'm the only one that has one now. I'd love to give somebody else one, but I just haven't had anybody kind of step up to the level where I felt comfortable doing that. Um, black shirt. Uh, so, just want to say thanks. The examples, the code from the top are there, the slides are there, it's the repo, you can report bugs there, and you can bug me on 